Folks, today I am joined by Sean Levy, director of projects such as Night at the Museum, Stranger Things, Free Guy, and The Adam Project, which hits theaters, I'm sorry, excuse me, which hits Netflix. Yeah, come on now. Now you're getting us into controversy. <laughs> which, <laughs> my brain is just starting to get back to the way that the world was, but I've got to remember that some things still do just stream, um, which hits Netflix on March 11th. Sean, congrats on the film, and thank you for joining me today, sir. Good to be here, man. Um, I want to start with both this film specifically and big picture. I think one of the strengths of this film, your recent work with Ryan, and your career as a whole is your ability to capture unexpected yet earned earnestness. Um, I think you're really able to tap into empathy, which is ultimately, to me, the heart of storytelling. What do you think the key to that is? Well, first of all, thank you. And... I guess I always wanted to tell stories and I've tried to commit myself to telling stories that are not simply what's expected of the genre, right? So like back when I was making Real Steel and everyone thought it was a boxing robot movie, yeah, it has some rad robots that box, but I knew I was making a father-son redemption story. Similarly, Free Guy, oh, you think it's about a video game action comedy, but no, I'm gonna use this NPC idea to tell a story about personal empowerment in the midst of a dystopian world. So I'm always looking for how can the movie subvert expectations and above all, how can it connect emotionally? Uh, and, and so I'm always looking for that, that sweet spot and that kind of pulsing beating heart at the center of the story. And so it's no accident that that's what shows up in pretty much everything I ever direct. Do you seek, projects that have that trait or is that a result of you imbuing your own ideas and themes into them uh that's a great question sometimes it's already baked in like adam project even the very first draft that ryan and i read it was already inherently emotional night at the museum no night at the museum was oh crazy museum comes to life but i was like no no this has to be about a guy who hasn't believed in himself and whose kid hasn't believed in him in so damn long. And he takes the crappiest job imaginable and finds that he's extraordinary, right? That was me injecting a resonant theme into the husk of a cool idea. So sometimes it's inherent, sometimes it's injected, but what matters is that by the time you as an audience watch the movie, it's there and you feel it, whether or not you expect it. Yes, sir. Uh, and so on the Adam Project, what, I mean, I guess we just kind of touched on it, but what about this specific story drew you to it? Have you ever fantasized about whether it be time travel or having a conversation with your past or totally. future self? Yeah, totally. I mean, as, as yeah, so on a general level, it was the fact that it was an opportunity to do a sci-fi adventure that was decidedly more emotional than cerebral. So on a, on a broad scope, level that was very appealing to me but 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 on a very specific level i don't think there's anybody who hasn't at some point or another wished they could go back and better understand their own history their younger selves their parents and make peace with that history so whereas a lot of time travel movies are about save the world adam project is really about one man saving his self Mm -hmm. And that's through a revisitation of his own history and realizing that, oh, wait a second, the stories I tell myself about my past aren't entirely accurate. And I know that's true of every human who ever lived. You did. A, you, you very cleverly uh, explain that in the film when the two characters are talking to e each other and the younger one says, like, you have forgotten some things that I am currently living through, man. Like, you, exactly. it's funny that even your past self could have knowledge that your future self doesn't. And I bet that would be the case for all of us. But that's such a rich idea. And I think the movies that I love most are are escapist and 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 spectacle filled and comedic. But they're about an idea that feels really juicy. And for me, for an idea to be juicy, it needs to compel my feelings in addition to my brain. It's why we spent five years on Arrival, for instance. Arrival was always a sick story and a cool script and a cool idea. But 
we knew that what would make or break it was that feeling, that feeling of would you choose love if you know love dies? Funny That's story about why, that. I go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, dude. Anyway, just that. Like, I really am always looking, whatever the genre I'm looking for, where's the idea that is both intellectually, but also emotionally resonant and relatable? Well, so you bring up something that I, I want to touch on. I jokingly, but seriously say that my favorite genre is not sci fi, but romantic sci fi with, with a romance story at the heart of it that just has the sci fi trapping. So, to that point, lovers finding each other across timelines, you know, I'll, I'll find you again type thing is one of my favorite cinematic tropes. Uh, were there any specific inspirations for the romance arc in, in this film, which features an always awesome Zoe Saldana? I mean, she was my favorite part of this film. She's on the screen probably the least, but she is just magnetic, man. Well, she is magnetic. And, and amazingly, she's magnetic on both ends of the spectrum in a way that is very, very rare. She is both a fierce, badass action hero, and she plays these achingly romantic scenes uh, with huge passion and huge, sincere heart. So I agree, I'm a huge fan. I've always been a fan, but I feel like in spite of whatever the screen time is, Adam Project is such a showcase of the actor that she is. It's something that I'm more, in general, very proud of with Adam Project is it's a lot of famous people, but it's reminding us before they were celebs, they were just dope actors. The work that Jen Garner does in this movie, the work that Ryan Reynolds does in this movie, right? Everyone kind of delivers on their sweet spot, but reminds you also that they just have straight up acting chops for days. Um, that being said, there are that kind of, I will find you across time, uh, those kind of iconic tropes of that genre. And I'm, it's a rarity that I draw a blank, um, but I too have always loved those kind of, just this notion of meant to be epic romance. And so while, while I was more conscious about kind of some of the more Amblin touchstones that inspired oh. me in making Adam Project. I mean, talk about those if you want. For me, I'm sounding like a film illiterate that I can't name a single epic romance. I put you on, on, on the spot, Give man. Give me I'm one. Sorry. How about you help me out? Like I'm cheating off your paper. Well, so in class. so one one the most recent one that I encountered was the HBO Max show Station Eleven. I don't know if I don't know if you had heard of it, but I have not a seen it. But it is I, I basically the whole point of Twenty One Laps. My company is I have like 18, 19 people who work for me, and they are essentially my taste army. So they are all out there ingesting culture on every front with every genre, every kind of tone, and they're constantly feeding me shit I need to watch. That's one of them, and I just haven't gotten to it yet. Let me tell you, the, the trailer for it is beautiful, but the reason that I bring that up is because in the trailer, it features a line. Heaven can wait. Hold on. Thank God. I just, <laughs> oh my God. Redemption! <laughs> Heaven can wait. There. Perfect. Next question, motherfucker. <laughs> oh, man, buddy. All right, let me... um. Let me ask you about your star, Ryan. You guys, I think you're very simpatico in terms of what you like to put forth on film and what he does well. What is it that Ryan brings to the table that di differentiates him from his fellow A-list square-jawed stars? I know. The jaw ugh, <laughs> makes me sick. I'm so jealous. Um, he has the pecs, the jaw, the shoulders, the slim legs, by the way, actually, I'm going to take that statement as a way into your answer. Here's what he has different. Ryan Reynolds has a scene in the movie in a tank top. He looks ridiculously good, okay? We're there shooting with this 12-year-old kid who plays young Ryan Reynolds. Ryan was feeding insults about himself for the 12-year-old to say. So literally, Ryan's there. And he goes, hey, Walker, Walker, make a joke about how everyone from the future must skip leg day. <laughs> because that's Ryan recognizing the fact that he has spindly little legs, massive, awesome on camera upper body. So what makes Ryan unique is the self-effacement, the ability to call BS on himself. He has elevated that self-deprecating humor to an art form. Mm -hmm. Also, as an addendum, he has a sweetness to him 
that mm. is so palpable, whether it's in definitely maybe or proposal or Deadpool or Free Guy and now Adam Project, there is the funny, there is the square jaw handsomeness, but there is a sweetness to him that for me is reminiscent of like a Jimmy Stewart fundamental goodness. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting because a few people have mentioned that Free Guy and Adam Project, there's almost like a Capra-esque kind of fable quality to both. And I know I'm inspired by Ryan's kind of every man, but better than every man right. quality. Well, since you guys have had such a su successful relationship so far, this film was not yet out, but I'm assuming it's going to stack up numbers. Do you guys have anything else in the works right now? Do you have any interest in making the jump with him to Marvel for Deadpool 3? Where? What do you guys have cooking? I I've been media coached to within an inch of my life. Also, Van City Reynolds coached to within an inch of my life. So you know I'm not answering that last one. Um, I will just say that I am a fan. Of I the have Marvel to try, movies. Sean. Uh, bro, of course. Where are we going next? Stranger Things? Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, we are developing at this very moment already four movies oh, wow. to do together. One of which is the only one we've announced, which is a sequel to Free Guy. We are both in the middle of our lives, in the middle of our careers. So we know a great thing when we stumble onto it. And this partnership, mm. we know it's a good thing. We're not letting go anytime soon. It's palpable, man. I totally agree. Thank you. Now, Thank if you, you don't mind, I do want to ask you about Stranger Things, if that's okay. See, Sarah. I'm a prophet. Talk to me about the continual process of upping the ante without overindulging or jumping the shark, whether that be in terms of Eleven's powers or the monsters that they have to face. And how does that bear itself in season four? I will tread carefully with my words. Mm. You will definitely see an escalation in season four in terms of scope, challenges, character depth cinematic scope is almost incomparable to what we've done in the prior three seasons. But the thing about the Duffers that I have always recognized as their superpower is that, yes, are they genre wonk nerds galore? Hell yes. Are they getting to play with every toy any movie nerd could ever dream of? Hell yes. But they have always understood that the actual special sauce of Stranger Things is the heart of these characters and the connections between them. It's an anthem to outcasts. And the brothers are coming from a very sincere and authentic place and telling that story. So they know, and I'm around to remind them of this if they ever forgot, but they never need my, my reminders. We can go bigger, but we got to always anchor in to our superpower, which is the heart of these characters and these relationships. So I think that's what keeps us from losing our way or jumping the shark is balance the scope with the intimate. Mm. And the Duffers have a phenomenal intuitive sense of how to do that. All right, Sean. So one more be before I wrap up, and I hope for the short time that we've talked, you've gotten a sense of who, who I am as a guy. So trust me when I say I'm not trying to gotcha here. I think it's a genuinely viable thing to ask. Given what's And if you want to skip it, go ahead. Given what's going on in the world right now, I was wondering, does season, do you look at season four's Russian setting differently? Do you think it will register with audiences differently given the new context that, that, that we all have? It's totally possible. I haven't given it a lot of thought, but the reality is that everything looks different now. Right. Everything looks different in light of these events if we are sensitive, globally aware people. And so I can't predict how it will change the read of certain things, but I think it's inevitable. And like you and the rest of us, I am watching day by day uh, with profound prayers and hopes for the millions of people who do not deserve what they are going through. Right. All right, Sean, thank you so much for your time. I find that all of your work has a huge heart. And now that I've gotten to meet you, I could see where that comes from. So th <laughs> thank you very much. Like sir. it you, or hate it. You're an absolute, me. you're an absolute firecracker. And I wish you all the best. Down, Thanks, down the road, brother. Sir. Nice. I enjoyed our chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Take care, Thanks. man. Bye-bye.